Um, welcome everyone. We're glad you're here joining us today. This is our first webinar after our 2019 summer season. Um, and we'd like to thank Androscoggin Bank for sponsoring us and enabling us to do this. I'd like to welcome uh, both Jack and Rebecca who will be presenting to us today on sexual harassment um, in the workplace. So um, over to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sitting on. And hi, I'm Jack Roller. And uh, I think we're on live. Um, Rebecca and I are attorneys at Curtis Thaxter, as probably many of you know. Uh, we represent children's camps in the state of Maine, as well as uh, the Maine Youth Camp Association and, and uh, Maine Summer Camps. And uh, this is a webinar. And the webinar today, we're going to discuss sexual harassment, uh, which is a law dealing with employment law. Uh, Rebecca and I teach this law to camp counselors uh, during uh, staff training week at many camps around the state of Maine. Uh, there we focus on the uh, obligations of and the rights of camp counselors in regard to this. Uh, today we're going to talk about and uh, focus on the obligations uh, of the employer in this situation. Uh, we're going to go uh, to a presentation software so that you will not see us uh, except for a few moments here at the beginning. Uh, but uh, you will see the slides as we talk. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, take notes if you want or uh, read what we're saying in outline form. Um, at the end, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of this, um, you'll be able to ask us questions and then uh, Ron is gonna send out uh, to everybody a copy of the slides uh, that we put up on the screen today. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, and um, what I'm going to do now is introduce the first, uh, pre uh, the, introduce the presentation with the first slide, and then um, Rebecca and I will trade off uh, and, and discuss the subject. So uh, can we get the first slide up? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right. And uh, so, as I said earlier, and I say again, <laughs> this is about sexual harassment. And sexual harassment is illegal in the workplace. And Rebecca, take it away, I hope. All right. <laughs> Let's see if we click it. Ah, there you go. Okay. Um, so as Jack said, sexual harassment is illegal in the workplace. And surprise, as fun as camps are, they are also workplaces. So that means that the main laws and the federal laws that cover employers cover you all. Is the screen functioning, Ashley? Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, okay. So, um, to back up um, and just explain why we're talking about this today, the prohibition against sex sexual harassment in the workplace is actually a subset of sex discrimination. Um, just like you as an employer cannot discriminate against employees for their race or national origin or religion or age or any other protected trait, you also cannot discriminate on the basis of sex and sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination and it's therefore illegal under both Maine and federal law. So um, now that you, the employer, know about sexual harassment, how do you make sure your employees know? That's what this requirement is. Um, the first thing you have to do before you even have your employees walk in the door that first day is you need to put up a poster that explains what sexual harassment is to them. So if you are an employer with 15 or more employees, this applies to you and you have an obligation as an employer to have a poster in a prominent and accessible location which provides information about sexual harassment. The poster you need is available on the Department of Labor website, the main DOL website, and it looks like this. Um, this is what the Maine Human Rights Commission sanctioned poster looks like. Like I said, it's available online for free and you are able to reproduce them so that you can post them around your camp. Um, you don't have to use this exact poster if you don't want to, but Maine law does require that the poster you put up um, contain certain elements, including a written notice of the illegality of sexual harassment and a description of sexual harassment using examples. So that's what you see here in this poster, um, saying that sexual harassment on the job is illegal and includes unwelcome sexual advances, suggestive or lewd remarks, unwanted hugs, touches, kisses, requests for sexual favors. And then it also needs to say that retaliation for complaining against sexual harassment is illegal. Um, 
where you post this, it needs to be posted in a prominent and accessible location in the workplace. So you can't stick it in a closet and think that that covers your duties under Maine law. Um, and the notice also has to be in plain English. The text that is used um, must not exceed sixth grade literacy standards. So you wanna have it in plain English so that your employees can understand it. Um, you'll see the poster also includes the contact information for the Maine Human Rights Commission so that if somebody does feel that they've been discriminated against, they have someone to contact in addition to somebody internally, um, which is what you would put at the bottom. So in addition to that poster, um, you also have an obligation under Maine law to annually provide all employees with individual written notice that includes at a minimum the following information. Um, and like the poster, you need to say that sexual harassment is illegal. You have to include the definition of sexual harassment. Your notice has to have a description of sexual harassment, again, utilizing examples. It also needs to set forth the complaint process that's available to the employee. It again needs to say what the legal recourse and complaint process through the Maine Human Rights Commission is. That's the state agency that's charged with investigating discrimination complaints information about how to contact the Maine Human Rights Commission, and again, a statement that protection against retaliation is provided under Maine law. Um, as a lawyer, we often suggest that when you provide this written notice, you keep some sort of record that you've given the notice to your employees, and you'll see that the requirement says that you annually provide all employees. All really does mean all, no exception. Um, so you wanna have some way of showing that you have delivered this notice to all employees in a way that ensures receipt. Um, and the statute itself actually suggests one way of doing this might be to include it with the employee's paycheck so that you know that they've received it. Um, so that's that. And then this is the, the notice must be delivered in a manner to ensure receipt by all employees. So in addition to these notice requirements, Maine law also says that employers must provide appropriate training to employees and supervisors. And this is a two-part training requirement. First, you have the requirement that you train all new employees within one year of their employment date. So you have a year to get this training completed and you need to train them on the same sexual harassment elements that we've described already what the definition of sexual harassment is, examples, what to do if they feel they've experienced sexual harassment. Um, the law does not have any requirement as to what kind of training you need to do, um, whether it's video or live or how long the training must be. But the Maine Human Rights Commission has noted that interactive training, in-person interactive, allowing people to ask questions, um, interactive training is considered the most effective. And then in addition to training all your new employees, you also have to conduct a second additional training for your supervisory and managerial employees within that same one year period um, because they have specific responsibilities um, that only affect supervisors and managers. So you need to train them on the methods that they may, must take to ensure immediate and appropriate corrective action in addressing sexual harassment complaints. With the training, you must also keep a record of the trainings that you've completed, um, including a record of the employees who have received the training. Because you have to hit all employees, you might need to conduct more than one training to make sure that you capture them all. It's not good enough for somebody to be out sick that day and miss the training. You have to make sure everyone gets the training. Um, and we again suggest that you keep a little checklist of who's gotten, gotten the training. Um, when I do this at other employers, I often have them sign a sign-in sheet so that you know who's there when you're doing the training and then you keep that record afterwards. Um, you as the employer have to keep your training records for at least three years and they have to be made available to the Department of Labor on request if they come in and inspect. Um, 
the state has also provided a checklist for employers to use to make sure that they're following the sexual harassment laws that uh, govern notice and training. So you can find that on the Department of Labor website and it's a good thing to use as a tool. So if you don't uh, meet all these notice and training requirements laws, um, there are penalties um, for you as an employer. And I will say these sexual harassment notice and training laws have been around for a while in Maine, but they've gotten more teeth lately. Um, back in 2018, sort of the last fall, the legislature added the new requirement of having this checklist to make sure that employers are actually following the notice and training requirements and it's getting a lot more attention now. Um, so the, the penalties for if you fail to post notice um, for your first violation, it's up to $25 a day that you don't have the notice up, not to exceed $1,000. If you fail to do it a second time within three years, it's going to be $25 to $50 per day, not to exceed $2,500. And then for third and subsequent violations within three years, um, you're looking at $25 to $1,000 per day that you don't have that notice up, not to exceed $5,000. So that's just posting that first poster. And then if you fail to provide that individual written notice to each employee and the training, um, your first violation will cost you $1,000. A second violation will be $2,500. And third and subsequent violations, $5,000. Um, and again, it does not take a violation of the sexual harassment. You don't need somebody complaining about sexual harassment to have these violations kick in. The Department of Labor could come in and check. And if you don't have any way of showing that you've met these notice and training requirements, you can be in trouble. Back to you, Jack. Okay, thank you very much. So um, the things that Rebecca just talked about, obviously, are things that you need to do as an employer as required by the law. They're kind of um, um, how you make sure that your employees understand the law and, and have notice of the law. So let's talk next about what the law says substantively. <clears throat> so in the, in the first instance, um, sexual harassment is defined uh, as follows. Um, it's defined as unwelcome, and I have highlighted that word and underlined it because that is the key word in sexual harassment. Um, it is defined as unwelcome sexual advances, uh, unwelcome requests for sexual favors, unwelcome uh, other verbal and physical conduct of a sexual nature. All of those uh, elements um, are built around the concept that it's unwelcomed conduct. So. That's the basic. If you remember the word unwelcome, you'll, uh, you can probably answer most questions that people ask, but um, that's the key word. So uh, what does that look like? Well, there's two ways um, that uh, sexual harassment can happen. Uh, and the first way is, is that uh, sexual harassment uh, can be um, caused by the aggressor of sexual harassment, can be the employer, um, or a supervisor or management person who is uh, as the same as the employer under the law. And essentially, um, it it's, uh, indicates that or it states that um, if the employer um, either makes uh, explicit or implicit terms or conditions uh, of an individual's employ employment are based on sexual or sex acts or, or sexual conduct that's illegal or uh, for example, if uh, a job assignment or an advancement in the place of employment were based on um, a sexual requests or sexual favors, um, that is against the law. What does that look like? Uh, when I teach staff, it looks like this. Um, I'm a lawyer. Um, I want to quit being a lawyer. I want to go and teach sailing in a camp. Um, I call up a, an employer and I go, uh, um, would you hire me to, to teach sailing at your camp? And the employer says, uh, Gee, Jack, I don't think so. Um, you're an old lawyer. I have uh, employees that can teach sailing, and so um, you're not somebody I want to hire. And to which I would reply, of course, uh, well, wait a minute. Um, if I'm not practicing law anymore, I need money to pay for my Mercedes or uh, my <laughs> European vacations, and therefore you really need to hire me to teach sailing. And the employer could come back and say, well, of course, um, we'll consider hiring you, but 
uh, whenever we're alone, um, I want you to wear a skinny little uh, Speedo bathing suit because it turns me on. Um, that is a very good example of sexual harassment. The employer is putting something, a requirement on me uh, of a sexual nature in order for me to take the job or in order for me to um, do the kind of job or the kind of work that I want to do at a place of employment. So that's sexual harassment that comes down from the employer to an employee. There's a second kind of sexual harassment, and that's this, um, which is uh, in some ways as important or even more important in the camp setting because um, this kind of sexual harassment says that uh, any conduct uh, between employees without regard to the employer, any conduct between employees uh, or between somebody else in the place of employment and an employee, uh, which has the purpose or the effect of unreasonably interfering with the other person's uh, work performance or creating an intimidating or hostile or offensive work environment is also illegal. So it's both illegal for an employer to ask for sexual favors uh, and it's illegal for uh, one employee or someplace, somebody in the workplace to ask another employee uh, for a sexual favor. Um, and um, the, the law spells out uh, elements of, uh, uh, of sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, and again, um, um, you can put on a skit to see these, but uh, for example, if uh, every morning um, uh, I uh, uh, came into the place of employment and saw another employee and uh, whistled and said, oh boy, you look really great this morning, um, that could be conduct, uh, which is sexual harassment. Um, if I uh, uh, touched another employee, had physical contact with another employee, and that conduct obviously was unwelcomed or unwanted, uh, that would be sexual harassment. <clears throat> if I decided that I wanted to tell jokes in the workplace and I told a joke to an employee who said to me, I don't want to hear that kind of uh, joke or I don't want to hear that kind of talk, that would be sexual harassment. Um, it's important to note here, and this is a good place to note it, that um, the conduct which is sexual harassment can be conduct between two employees which affect another one. So, um, for example, if I got up every morning and I told uh, my buddy uh, a joke of a sexual nature and he laughed and I laughed and he told me a joke of a sexual nature and I laughed and he laughed, <clears throat> that would not be sexual harassment because the key word is missing, it's unwelcome, and so that's not sexual harassment. But if each and every morning we got up and we told that joke in front of somebody else or some other group of people and they said, look, fellas, we don't like that, that's not conduct that we think is appropriate uh, and that we continue to do that, that would be sexual harassment. Um, uh, sexually explicit pictures, um, um, I, when I teach this, I used to say, uh, uh, picture in your penthouse magazine, uh, my <laughs> secretary says I'm old, uh, that now I should say, uh, I wanna send you a picture on Snapchat. Uh, and obviously, again, if it's an unwelcomed uh, thing, then that would be sexual harassment. Uh, demands are repeated requests for sexual favors, um, asking again and again, can I touch you or um, um, do you want a hug or whatever it would be, which is unwelcome, uh, is also an example. Um, obscene gestures, again, uh, in the workplace, uh, inappropriate and uh, suggestive or insulting comments. Now, that's an actual list that uh, is published by the federal government and uh, state governments about sexual harassment. Uh, but the key to remember is, is that it's conduct of a sexual nature, which is unwelcomed by the target. Um, and that's the key that you need to keep in mind. So um, with that in mind, let's uh, think about this subject, which is uh, what a target, what a somebody who is the target of sexual harassment should know about sexual harassment. And probably um, uh, the most important thing is uh, obviously, that they can communicate with the aggressor, the person who's acting out, to say that that conduct is unwelcome, um, that they don't wanna see that conduct, they don't wanna have that conduct happen. I think it's important to note here that uh, communication is not a requirement. For example, if uh, you were the subject of a physical rape uh, with violence, uh, it would be unlikely that you might be able to communicate with the aggressor that the behavior was unwelcome. If, for example, um, you were looking for a job or looking for advancement and you're dealing with a supervisor and 
uh, the supervisor is acting toward you in a sexual way that you don't like, you may be reluctant to say anything to that supervisor because, uh, for example, you may worry that your job uh, is at risk or your promotion is at risk for talking. But generally speaking, communicating with the aggressor is a, a very uh, good way to see if uh, that will stop. Obviously, if it doesn't, um, <clears throat> what's very important is to keep a record of each incident because when you report it, um, you want to make sure that you remember that on a specific day this happened, uh, that it happened more than once, uh, whatever it is, and by keeping that record, uh, you will have that record available to you uh, when you make the report. So um, if you're the target, you should keep those in mind. Um, you should report the incident to a supervisor. Um, obviously, if the supervisor is the sexual aggressor, then there would be somebody over them. Um, many camps have a designated person or persons to whom an incident of sexual harassment should be reported, and you should report that to those uh, persons um, if it's happening to you. Um, the camp is required by law to take, make an investigation, to take appropriate action uh, on your behalf, once you make the, uh, the report. And critical to this law is that the law forbids an employer from retaliating against an employer for exercising these rights. So if I went to my employer and I said that X is sexually harassing me and my employer said, well, Jack, um, I really like X. X is an important employee here and you ought to just buck up and take it. Uh, and if you don't, uh, your job is uh, at stake here because I don't like you complaining. So uh, retaliation against you um, is in fact um, um, something which uh, the law forbids. Okay, um, let's uh, take the next one, um, which is, is that um, for uh, some reason you as the target uh, can't uh, report to your employer, your employer, the senior person in your place of employment is the aggressor um, or uh, you make a decision that you don't want to report it to the employer, you can report it to an agency here in the state of Maine. Rebecca earlier referred to it. It's called the Maine Human Rights Commission. Um, as she said, there's a poster up in your place of employment uh, and that you, know, you go to look at that poster and you obviously as the employer have to make sure that that poster is up in your place of employment. So an employee can go to the Maine Human Rights Commission and make a complaint. Uh, the key here is to be timely in uh, making that complaint. So uh, a target would uh, want to make that the complaint to the Maine Human Rights Commission within 300 days of the last incident. Um, it's important that, that, to understand that the employer uh, will respond. Um, that is to say, the Maine Human Rights Commission will go to the employer and say, what's going on here? And the employer will respond to that complaint. Uh, and is required to respond. And if the, uh, main, uh, the, the main Human Rights Commission will then investigate uh, based on the response of the employer and the, and the complaint of the employee, uh, and it will report its findings uh, to the employee and to the employer. And um, if reasonable grounds are found um, uh, to, uh, to indicate that sexual harassment has happened, and then the main Human Rights Commission will uh, oftentimes uh, try to work with the employer and the employee to see if the, uh, you can find a way to stop that conduct from happening in the future uh, and, uh, and to resolve the problem. Um, if for any reason that doesn't work, uh, then the law permits uh, a target uh, to go uh, to a court and bring an action uh, against the aggressor and against the employer um, as the result of that conduct. So um, those are the um, the, the things that a target should know uh, and, and um, uh, the substance of the law. And Rebecca is going to talk to you about what uh, a camp uh, as an employer should know at this point. Right. Okay. So that was the target's role in sexual harassment. So let's shift back to what the camp as an employer, what the camp's role is in preventing sexual harassment and dealing with it if it does happen. Um, so the first thing the camp should be aware of is um, that defining respectful and appropriate behavior should begin long before an incident of harassment actually occurs. Um, you guys all know about setting camp culture early and part of that culture should be setting forth a standard that does not allow for sexual harassment to grow. 
Um, one thing to be mindful of with a multicultural staff when you've got folks coming from other countries, other backgrounds, um, not everyone understands sexual harassment issues through the same lens. So you might need to do some additional training there to make sure everyone knows what behaviors are acceptable at camp in America. Um, it's up to the camp to set a behavior standard that everyone knows about and agrees with and signs onto. Um, because that then makes it easier for coworkers to recognize inappropriate behavior amongst themselves and to speak up to sexual harassment aggressors. So let's say you have all of those things in place, but you still hear that some incident of sexual harassment has been reported. Um, your responsibility as an employer is to promptly respond to a harassment report. That means you don't sit on it for a month and think about what you're going to do with it. Um, what that means is you should immediately get legal assistance. That lawyer will help you conduct an investigation. That's an internal investigation where you're going to be speaking to, you know, to the target who reported it, to the reported harasser, the alleged harasser, to any witnesses to the event, anything else that you think might be relevant. Um, together, you and your legal assistants will decide a course of action. And then it's up to the camp to follow through with that course of action. Um, following these steps should not only help solve the problem before it grows into something bigger, but it will also provide you with a legal defense. Because if in the event that a complaint is later filed with the Maine Human Rights Commission, one of the things that they're going to be looking at is, okay, you got a complaint reported to you, then what did you do? And you as the employer want to be able to say, well, you know, I did this, I conducted an investigation, this is what we found out, this is why we decided to do what we did. Um, and timely action also demonstrates to your employees internally that this is a serious matter that you as an employer take it seriously um, and that that may hopefully um, help reduce future inappropriate behavior if people know that this sort of behavior is not just going to be something that's swept under the rug. So if if there is a complaint filed against you um, and you end up getting sued for sexual harassment, uh, what can you be liable for? You as an employer, even if you are not the one personally doing any sexual harassing, you as the employer at the camp are liable for sexual harassment of an employee by a supervisor. And that's one of the reasons that you have that additional supervisor training, because they need to know that any actions that the supervisor takes are actions of the camp. The camp is not a standalone person, so the actions of the camp are measured by the actions of the camp's managers and supervisors. So you can be liable if a supervisor sexually harasses an employee. You can also be liable um, for any harassment done by one employee to another employee. So coworkers, um, an employer is liable for sexual harassment from one coworker to another, even if they're not supervisors, if the employer knew or the law says should have known that about the sexual harassment and failed to take immediate and appropriate action. So it's not enough to hide in your office and say, I didn't know anything was happening because if the law says you should have known, this was reported to you and you should have known. And by you, again, I mean the supervisors should have known, um, then the camp can be liable. They can also be the second part of that sentence. You can also be liable for sexual harassment of one of your employees in the, work in the workplace even by somebody who's not an employee of yours that you don't necessarily have full control over. So a delivery or a service person who visits the camp, if one of them is sexually harassing your employees, you can be held liable or a visitor to the camp, even a camper um, can, be, can be sexually harassing or a parent of a camper. Um, you have to think about the fact that the law is created to make to create a workplace that is free from harassment, whatever the source for your employees. So the source doesn't matter. It's whether the workplace is a safe place for your employees. 
Um, and when I said you are liable if you do not take immediate and appropriate action, you might wonder what immediate and appropriate action is. And I don't have a definite answer for you because that will depend on the facts of any given situation. So that's again why you would want to engage someone to help you through that. An employer can also be liable, there's more, um, you can also be liable for the failure of your supervisors to fulfill their obligations to prevent, report, and investigate sexual harassment. Again, this goes back to what your supervisors do is what the employer itself does. And again, why you want to make sure that they have the training to understand that they have heightened obligations when it comes to preventing sexual harassment. Um, and Jack alluded to this earlier, you can also be liable for retaliation against an employee for reporting sexual harassment. And I will say, I will reiterate what Jack said, this is an important piece. And in my line of work, um, I see often that more often than not, the retaliation claims can be successful even when the sexual harassment claim is not. Um, so sometimes an employee alleges that they were sexually harassed and they also allege that they were retaliated against for reporting the sexual harassment. And sometimes courts and juries have said, you know what, we find that behavior didn't quite rise to sexual harassment. It wasn't severe and pervasive enough um, to be sexual harassment. But even though you didn't prove sexual harassment, you did prove retaliation. And retaliation can take many forms. It's not just being fired for reporting. Um, it can sometimes be something that seems a lot more innocent, like you, know, you as the employer trying to separate the two employees that are having, one of them has reported sexual harassment, the other one is the reported harasser. And you say, okay, I'll, I'll just separate them so maybe I'll put the target to this lesser position to keep them away from the harasser by moving that target to something that could be perceived as a lesser position, putting them on a duty that they wouldn't necessarily have liked as much. Um, that can be seen as retaliation or saying, you know, they were scheduled to go on a wilderness trip together, but I'm going to keep the target back here at camp, even though he or she really wants to go on the trip. I need the harasser to go on the trip, so therefore the target cannot go on the trip. That could be seen as retaliation um, against the target for reporting sexual harassment. So you wanna be careful what you do there. Um, and again, going back to the penalties for this. So employers who are found liable by a court for sexual harassment in the workplace can face some pretty strict um, penalties. You get a court order to stop um, engaging in unlawful practices, making sure that that doesn't happen again. And then you can also be made to open up your wallet um, because the compensatory and punitive damages and punitive damages are ones that are meant to punish the camp for allowing this behavior to occur. Um, if you've got 15 to 100 employees, those damages can be up to $50,000. If you've got over 100 employees, up to 200 employees, that can cost you up to $100,000. And if you have more than 200 employees, you're facing up to $300,000 in damages. And that's in addition to attorney's fees, um, not just the attorney's fees that you would spend trying to defend your case, but if the employee succeeds and wins in court against you as the employer, you're also going to pay their legal fees. So you're paying both sides plus the court costs. Um, and all of that is in addition to what you can imagine is gonna be pretty significant reputational damage because court cases are public matters. So you are gonna be in the papers and other people are gonna find out about this. I keep mentioning supervisors when I talk about you as employers. Um, so just to reiterate what supervisors should know, this is one of the things that they will learn in their special training, that they are required to actively prevent and stop inappropriate conduct in the workplace, even if they are not sure it is sexual harassment, because sometimes it can be hard to know where that line is um, and whether something was unwelcome or, or not. So stopping the behavior even before you fully fleshed out whether you're sure it's sexual harassment is what supervisors need to do. Um, even an offhand, offhand comment um, should be taken as a complaint. If somebody says, oh, so-and-so 
you know, said this to me or, or tried to massage me again and I don't like it, take that as a complaint if you are a supervisor hearing about it. Um, you must take action as a supervisor. The first step is to consult the appropriate person up the chain of command. Don't assume that you can handle everything and you've taken care of it. Always report up because the camp needs to know um, from the top level what's going on. And supervisors also need to know that they cannot guarantee confidentiality to somebody who reports an incident because going back to what we said earlier, um, the camp is going to need to conduct an investigation and so that will involve speaking to other people so you cannot guarantee confidentiality. Jack? Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, we've talked about uh, what employers need to know and their supervisors need to know. Um, uh, we've talked earlier about um, uh, the, what the target needs to know. So who else could be involved in this situation? Well, um, let's think about bystanders, um, people who uh, observe or uh, are part of um, a group in which uh, sexual harassment is occurring. Um, what is it that uh, they ought to know uh, about sexual harassment? Um, and we think uh, that uh, these are really important. Uh, one, um, bystanders should do something. Um, they should speak up. They should not remain silent uh, when they witness sexual harassment because uh, remaining silence, silent uh, normalizes uh, that behavior. Essentially, the target goes, well, geez, in this place of employment, uh, sexual harassment goes on and nobody seems to care. That happens in the workroom and everybody uh, sees it, but nobody speaks up. So by speaking up as a bystander, um, you make sure that the, that the sexual harassment conduct is not normalized uh, but is uh, brought to the attention of the aggressor. I'm also speaking up um, clearly lessens the burden on the target. Um, in a situation where sexual harassment uh, happens, the target can feel like uh, um, the left out person, nobody seems to care, or this goes on in the workplace, uh, everybody ignores it, uh, and what the heck am I gonna do uh, by having other people speak up, obviously the target uh, gets the feeling that uh, that they're not alone uh, in with this problem. Um, as a bystander, uh, what do you? How, how can you do this? Well, you, you know, you can use humor. Uh, we don't, you know, oh, we, that must be a joke, uh, but it's not very funny. Or you can use verbal or nonverbal expressions of disapproval. You can interrupt the harasser. You can change the subject. Um, you can insert yourself uh, in the situation. Um, all of that behavior. Uh, could be very helpful to the target uh, and um, alert the aggressor who claims not to understand or know what his or her conduct is that obviously his or her conduct is inappropriate. So um, bystanders uh, do something um, and uh, be active. Um, there are situations um, in which uh, confronting the aggressor is not going to work or um, is going to actually aggravate the situation. Um, does that then relieve you as a bystander? No. Um, you ought to go uh, find the aggressor uh, maybe after the situation is over and uh, say, we don't do that here at camp. That's not behavior which is appropriate. Uh, that's behavior which is reportable. Uh, that's behavior which is uh, punishable. Uh, and obviously, um, it's a good idea that you not uh, do that. Um, you should support the target in every way you can. Um, say to the target, uh, are you okay? Um, can I help you? Uh, if the target says, I, I want to report, but I don't know how you could assist the target in that way. Again, uh, reaching out and helping the target uh, relieves the burden of the, of the target uh, in this particular situation. Uh, and finally, obviously, um, if you observe an incident of sexual harassment, you need to report that. Uh, and um, that is an obligation that you have and that even if the target says, oh, I don't want to lose my job or I don't want something bad to happen to me or please don't uh, uh, report it, um, remaining silent uh, is a very dangerous step to take because it, again, normalizes the sexual harassment. So as the bystander, it's critically important uh, that you go to the supervisor or the employer and even if the, uh, uh, the target says, please don't do it, um, go ahead and do it because it's important to do. 
So uh, as bystanders, uh, we all have those obligations. How about um, every, all of us, all of us, everyone in camp, what should we know? Um, and um, this is really uh, important uh, because obviously all the rest of us, uh, our employees in a camp setting or are in the camp setting um, have an obligation. We ought to understand that. Uh, first of all, um, it, it seems to me that you start at this position, and that is, is that working at camp is a job. Um, uh, a counselor staff has a job, and they have to work together as a team. And so uh, summer is not an opportunity to hit on somebody, um, but is a real job that needs to be done um, in a camp setting. Uh, next, we ought to all of us understand that sexual harassment is not acceptable behavior at camp, and uh, frankly, not anywhere else either. But critically important to this process is to understand that it is not acceptable um, and is, in fact, illegal, as we have pointed out. Uh, three, make sure your conduct is not unwelcome to somebody else. So I think uh, my dirty jokes are the best uh, dirty jokes in the whole world. and. Um, and uh, so I uh, reach out to uh, one of my co-employees um, and, uh, and uh, want to tell those jokes. Uh, I have to think about my behavior. Is it unwelcome to somebody else? And obviously, if there's an, a chance that that is the case, then uh, we, each of us have an obligation uh, because we're all working together as a team not to have our conduct uh, be unwelcome to somebody else. Uh, and this is really important. Um, it is not what your intent is. Um, I may uh, want to uh, touch a co-employee because I really genuinely like them. I feel close to them uh, and it feels good to touch them. Um, and I don't mean anything by it except that I want to be their friend. But it's not your intent, which is the key. It is the effect of your conduct on the target, the other co-worker. So even though you may think that um, that uh, that uh, touching is okay, if the target does not, uh, then the behavior is sexual harassment, and you ought to not be engaging in it. And finally, um, I guess it's really important to understand uh, that nothing is more destructive of a team than sexual harassment. So. Um, um, that's uh, what we wanted to talk about today. Um, we leave you with this thought, and that is, is that camps are a fabulous place to teach uh, respectful behavior. Uh, and uh, we hope that we've covered the subject enough to give you a good introduction. And at this point, uh, we will, uh, again, I guess our faces will appear, uh, and we'll take questions. Well, the questions are there on the right. So okay. far, there are no questions. All right. All right, so um, we put everybody to sleep. <laughs>
how can we get it? And um, the poster is available online. It's very simple to get. Go to the, the uh, Department of Labor website. Uh, we can post a link probably. And, uh, yeah, or, or we could, uh, Ron could uh, send out a link for it. Yes. We could put it in the next home on it. Right. Uh, does anything change for the employer if a situation occurs during... <laughs> <laughs> during non-work hours and or off-site, unwanted conduct, that sort of thing. Good question. Excellent question, excellent question. The, the notorious Christmas party. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, the, and and, and um, 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 the good answer or the lawyer answer to that is it depends. Um, it depends on the situation. For example, um, if the conduct happens in camp, uh, where the employer employees can uh, go uh, when they're off duty, for example, um, that conduct could, uh, in fact, and is in fact, um, sexual harassment because it's happening at camp. Um, if you know, as the employer, about sexual harassment offsite, you would be. Um, uh, we, we would recommend that you take some action. Um, it's not as clear uh, about that. Um, but, but obviously, um, if it's taking place off site, it's likely to be taking place in the place of employment as well. Rebecca, you got yeah, more? Or yeah, what? that's true. And I referenced, um, holiday parties just because that is something that I've seen a lot of, obviously outside the camp context, but with other employers where a lot of times inappropriate behavior starts or bleeds over into these outside social events that aren't mandatory. It's not part of your employment that you go to this, you know, bar where they're holding the party or whatever. Um, but a lot of times that's where drinking and other things happen and people aren't always on their best behavior. And because it is connected to the workplace, it is often treated as part of um, your workplace obligations as an employer, whether you had any control over it. And, that, and that's a that's a that's a really important point. If it's a party that takes place at somebody's home and the employees, the employer has no involvement in it, then it's less likely right. to be considered a harassment behavior there. If the employer sponsors it, it's the Christmas party sponsored by the employer or the the, the uh, site in camp where people can go to when they have time off and it's a it's a place that the employer knows about and or should have known about <laughs> or should have known about right Turned um, to so so the connection between the employer and that party or get together is an important piece of it more questions I can't well, see them at on all <laughs> on the issue of proving that we have offered the information to our staff Will that be as of now, moving forward, or in past years as well? Um, the the uh, I don't know the answer to that specifically. I do know this: that the Department of Labor sends somebody around to camp. You get you folks who are in camp business get visited by a representative of the DOL, and the DOL can ask for the poster, uh, can ask for your information about training. Will they do that for past years? Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but obviously if you don't have it this year, uh, that, that would lead me to uh, ask the next question, well, can you show me last year's? Um, so um, you can't go back and undo what you've done, but obviously it's important to move forward here and make sure your record is clear. I can't guarantee they won't ask about the past. Yeah, and then the new checklist requirement that I referenced that you're supposed to follow these checklist things, including the notice and training, requirements that went into effect last year, um, last fall. So it would have missed you for last season, presumably. So this past year would be the first year that you should have been following this checklist, um, which we can again provide the link for, right, Ron? And then yes. even if you didn't do it in real time, I would suggest if you still know, you know, we held the training on X date, just put some sort of document in your file just so that for your records, you know that you did it and it'll hopefully trigger you to remember to do it next year as well. Um, how would you recommend handling a situation where an employee reports sexual harassment on behalf of another employee who is afraid or unwilling to report or speak about the sexual harassment himself or herself? Um, tough question uh, and, and good question. Um, 
the answer to that is, is that you as the employer have an obligation and that you can't get out of that obligation because it's been reported to you by another employee. Once you know you have an obligation to do something. So you need to do it and you need to do it obviously carefully, but I would start by asking the, uh, the target person to come in and chat with you. Um, I would want to uh, have you have another person in the room with that person. Uh, with the conversation and that your approach to that person is is that um, you're reaching out to them because uh, you've become aware of it uh, and that um, uh, that that uh, um, your concern is great and that uh, that your obligation is equally great and that you would like their help in understanding what happened uh, and to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and what sort of documentation should you be keeping as an employer when you have those conversations and like I know that that's often difficult in the pace of camp because you're having multiple different things going on at once mm -hmm. but what's your recommendation yeah. um, lawyers always say the Shocking same thing <laughs> write it down write it down <laughs> write it down, <laughs> write it down. Right. And, and you often suggest keeping it in a separate file from the employees other files so that if you do end up in court later or somebody asks for i'd like to see everything you have on this alleged incident then you can hand them this separate file that has everything you have about the alleged incident without you know oh, yeah, that, yeah without personal. say the counselor's yeah. medical records and everything else because those are kept in a separate file yeah so separately keeping records is is a really important concept but but uh, yeah, lawyers want you to write it down write it down write it down write it down and the more detail the better um, the one recommendation uh, we always make is, is that when you make your report, when you're doing the reporting that you're making, uh, you do it in a neutral way um, because you, you don't want to put body English on it at all because what you're trying to do is weigh in your own mind what's going on here. And you don't want to be confused by, by, oh, well, it wasn't as bad as they said it was. Those kinds of comments don't get into just that facts. material. Just, yeah, just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. yeah, just the, the facts. And the closer you can do it contemporaneously to when you're actually conducting the investigation, the better. You mentioned it gets very busy and things. You might be like, oh, I'll write this report over the weekend when I have a little bit more time. But it's really better to do it as close in time as you can. And as Jack said, if you can have two people sort of sitting in on those interviews, that helps because then one of you can just be focused on the conversation and getting the facts out while the other one can be focused on actually writing them down. One more piece, if to the extent that somebody else is writing that down, not the employer, you need that person to sign it. Uh, and to, to be, it, it may be written down, you might want to then type it back up or type it up so it was readable uh, and then go back to the, the person who gave you that statement or wrote it originally and ask them to sign it. And again, it's important you do that sooner rather than later because obviously in camps employees go away and when they go away they go a long way away and you may not be able to uh, get that back so having that signed is important is there another question up there yes yes all right uh the question is just a statement what about camper on camper okay <clears throat> camper on camper is not employment sexual harassment because employment, uh, sexual harassment is defined by the Department of Labor and the Maine Human Rights Commission has to do with places of employment, obviously, therefore employers and employees. Um, but um, uh, but uh, child to child sexual harassment happens and that then takes you back to two uh, different laws. One is uh, the laws around uh, sexual harassment of children uh, which we're not going to cover today, but we could cover it some other time. Rebecca and I cover it when we do camp talks, counselor talks in camp. Uh, and the other uh, law, which is important, we also cover when we do counselor talks in camps, is called duty of care, uh, which is the obligation of the camp as in loco parentis um, to make sure that children are safe. And so uh, child on child uh, sexual abuse, obviously, uh, needs to be investigated and stopped and and uh, and considered as uh, as an important an issue as sexual harassment. And the other thing with camper on camper is that there's a possibility that the camper is modeling his or her behavior on things that they are seeing within the camp from your employees. So it's something to also be mindful of and keep an eye out where are they learning this behavior. Right. 
if it's not coming from home where, where Jack might be talking about it. Um, and I did mention earlier, this isn't the question, but um, we have had camps report that sometimes there is camper on counselor, camper on staff, sexual harassment, because sometimes the age difference isn't that great. A camper can make camp life workplace uncomfortable for a counselor or a staff member. So that's something to be mindful of because even though the camper is not an employee, they are making things, um, it is unwelcome for to the counselor or the staff person. Okay, and is there another one yet or did no? We? No, that's it. Okay, that's we got it all and yeah. we ran about an hour and so uh, yeah. that looks good. I'd but... like to say really thank you. Um, it was definitely very informative and I learned something new today, yeah. which I appreciate um, that you spending the time here and um, getting all this down on a webinar where we can reference <laughs> again and go back over and like closer to the season and making sure we do have all our things in place that we need in place prior to the season. So I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you guys. Great. And thank Great. you to Andrew Stallion Bank. That's right. That's right.